will be participating not only at the Freedom Forum, the Forum da Liberdade, which is in the 23rd edition, in the inflation panel, uh, but also uh, will be a keynote speaker to our conference, the first uh, Austrian schools conference in Brazil. Uh, welcome. Uh, the theme of the, of the Freedom Forum is the book by Mises that we call in Brazil the Six Lessons. It's the economic policy book. Uh, tell us a little bit of your impressions of Ludwig von Mises. Well, he really lived up to what he urged others to live up to in, in that he wrote technical scholarly treatises for the scholarly community, but he also could write a book like Economic Policy that anyone can read. It's, it's so simply written, you almost wonder if it really could be Mises. And he encouraged this. He said that we cannot afford to leave economics in the classrooms. We have to bring it to the common man. Because this, is, this, is, this affects everybody. And we are all caught up in this, in this great struggle. And everyone needs to be armed with knowledge. So, he, and he's also a great model for not, um, not modifying your message to please influential people. Mm -hmm. He didn't care. He didn't care that he was marginalized, that he was laughed at. He told the truth as he saw it. And the reward for that is that nearly now four decades, we're approaching four decades after his death, he is remembered, whereas all the other professors teaching at New York University at that time are long forgotten. No one even knows who that was there. But he has institutes now being named after him, new generations of students learning from him. His book, Human Action, continues to sell very well, even though it's 900 pages long. He had the last laugh. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I, the other day I saw this sticker for Kurt. Mises was right. Yeah. So that's, there you a, go. that's a lovely sticker. Yeah. Um, you wrote Meltdown, which is a bestseller for I don't know how many weeks in the New York Times. Ten. Uh, ten weeks. Yeah. Wow. Um, tell me a little bit about the theme of Meltdown and how does it factor into the present context after the crisis? Yeah, sure. Well, the idea behind Meltdown, the reason I did it was that I was pretty certain that what would happen was that the conventional wisdom would take shape according to which the free market is just prone to these crises and we're just living through another one. And so, of course, we're going to have to give up some more freedoms to our wise overlords who will set everything right. And I thought, no, there needs to be an, al an, al an alternative point of view out there before the public that is published as one of the first books on the subject, because everyone is going to write a book on this subject. You've got to get yours out in the beginning or it'll get buried by all the others. So what I wanted to suggest was that to the contrary, it was the wise overlords who were more to blame than anybody else. That the other people they're targeting as the culprits are really bit players in the grand scheme of things. That basically what we've had is, in the US case, we had a housing bubble that was made possible by, and could not have occurred without, the central bank, the Federal Reserve System. And that the artificially low interest rates encourage uh, malinvestment, encourage overconsumption, all of which is unsustainable. The physical resources to see all these projects through do not exist. And so it is, an, it is a very, very insidious form of intervention into the market rather than the market itself that sets this, this bust in motion that looks healthy in the beginning. It looks like a boom, but it's the Austrian economists who saw through the false promises of the boom and knew that it would wind up in this devastating bust. So it was very important that we focus on the real culprits and that we not let the central bank get away with its usual charade of posing as the great savior when these crises just occur for no reason, no explanation for them, and then the central bank comes in and saves us. The central bank wouldn't need to save us if it hadn't caused the problem to begin with. What would you say uh, to the charges that uh, it was exactly due to government interventions that we appear to have a, a recovery now? Yeah. Well, I think the key word there is appear. I think we have uh, a lot of zombie economies around the world now that have the appearance of health because government statistics seem to indicate that they have health. So, you know, gross domestic product, which is very, very subject to manipulation by government stimulus. If the government 
spends $300 on a $10 hammer, the gross domestic product goes up $300. You know, this, but, but what I've been arguing is that the, the stimulus packages they've engaged in, fiscal and monetary, are propping up an artificial economy. What the free market wants to do is restore the economy to long-term healthy growth, to, to ease, to, to move resources out of bubble sectors and into real growth sectors, to reallocate resources out of the false boom portions and into the healthy portions. The government is trying to prevent this process from occurring. And temporarily it can do that and make, make it appear that prosperity has occurred. But as I noted in an interview that we did earlier with a journalist, in the US, the housing sector has seemed to be regaining some health, but now that they're taking some, some of the government supports away from it, the central bank supports and the artificial government policies to encourage first-time homeowners, once those have gone away, the housing market has again gone back down. That's the market saying, you can't do this forever. There are too many houses. There is, by some, by some estimates, there is a million house overhang on the market. Now you can try and print up money and prop up this market, but eventually the market will have its revenge. And that's what's going on now, is that the, that the, the prosperity, so-called, is just as phony as it was during the boom. And that we need, we need to, to restore our economy to real long-term prosperity, not phony propping up of something that can't last. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about Europe. Uh, we are seeing now some of the weakest countries over there yeah. had the, the, the worst management of their finances starting to have problems, such as Greece, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how do you think that uh, the Euro story will play out? Uh, there's from one side a tendency to try to centralize things, but also there's a question of the sovereign states that want to give yeah. up some of the sovereignties. How do you see the the euro going? Well, it's a good question. I mean, the, the, the European powers originally agreed that uh, they would impose limits on how much debt a country could get into as a percentage of GDP. And none of these things have been enforced. So it's not really clear going forward what, really what's, what the value is of everybody being together when, when the policies that are supposed to guide them all are being systematically ignored, but then secondly, Greece is, is sort of enduring something that other countries have not yet endured, which is they're in an economic crisis, but they don't have the sovereign authority to create euros, so they can't inflate their way out of it. So they are now reliant, absolutely reliant on some kind of bailout. Now, this it's possible this may make some countries think maybe the euro isn't worth it if it means we have to engage in these austerity programs. Maybe, to heck with it, maybe it's better to have the old system of every country having its own, I mean, which I think is also a crummy solution, mm -hmm. but those are the only two solutions on the table, as usual, two rotten solutions. Um, but then secondly, if, if Europe does in fact decide to bail out Greece, and then behind Greece, several other countries, and then if those are bailed out, the moral hazard will be such that other countries will eventually need to be bailed out. What's going to happen to the euro? I mean, the Europeans were boasting about the euro for a long time and, and implicitly or sometimes explicitly joking about the fate of the dollar. Well, I think the shoe is on the other foot now. If these bailouts go through, what's going to happen to the euro? It's going to make the dollar look like you know the best thing in the world, which is not a compliment. So, Long term, what's going to happen to the euro? What's going to happen to the European Union? Well, I mean, these these uh, you'll have wealthy countries wondering why they're bailing out the, the not so wealthy ones, and secondly, the not so wealthy ones are going to see that even they are not so sure how much they benefit if they lose the sovereign power to create money and, as they believe, stimulate their economies and ease these prices. So, so in other words, it may break up for all the wrong reasons. You are the writer of Church of the Market. How do you see this uh, revival of the continental tradition in Europe, uh, of France and Italy, uh, as opposed to uh, the Anglo-Saxon tradition that we mostly inherited? How do you see that uh, revival? 
Uh, the Scholastics. The Spanish Scholastics. Oh, I see. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, oh, no, I understand now. Um, well, I think this is great. It's been, uh, th this is a almost overlooked or forgotten part of the history of economic thought, such that up until really the mid 20th century, everyone, I think, had a very stunted view of the history of economic thought, that, there, that a lot of it just emerged simultaneously during the Enlightenment. And I think it's been shown pretty convincingly, and Schumpeter argued it in, in 1950, that, in fact, he said that the first scientific economists were the late scholastics of, this, of the 16th, 17th centuries in, in, in Spain, but, but really you know, throughout Western Europe. And, and I think this is, this is very good because this strain of thought emphasizes teachings that are very much in line with what the Austrians teach about uh, subjective value. And, and then when it comes to, to positive economic policy, well, the late scholastics did, by and large, with some exceptions, believe in a free price system, a free labor market. They were critical of monetary inflation. Uh, this is all very good, and they all, and, but particularly on, on subjective value and emphasize, emphasizing the utility of the consumer. This is an important counterbalance because it's the correct view to the emphasis in the Anglo-Saxon tradition on uh, labor value and the labor theory of value, which. I think pushed economics down the wrong direction. The, the, the French and the Spanish were emphasizing that value comes not from how much labor is put into something, because if I don't want that thing, then the va they, they, they understand that, the, that value comes exactly the opposite way. That first I have in my mind something that I desire, and then I desire that good, and then all the inputs that go into producing that good, the value of those things derives from the value I place on the finished good. So it's not that it's very expensive to dive for, for diamonds and therefore you know, you know di to dive for precious metals or, or gems and therefore that makes them expensive. It's the opposite. It's that because they're highly valued and expensive, people are willing to dive for them. So that's the correct cause and effect and that comes from the scholastics. So that's a very welcome tradition. Let's go back a little bit to the crisis again. Uh, Brazil is one of the BRICs, uh, along with Russia, India, and China. And except maybe for Russia, the other BRICs did well after the crisis. And they're all uh, interventionist governments. How do you, would you explain that apparent contradiction with the Austrian uh, tradition? Well, n not knowing enough about their own internal policies, nevertheless, I think that uh, Number one, I'm not sure I believe some of the Chinese GDP figures. I, I mean, I, who's compiling them? I, I, you know, I mean, we, we got into a lot of trouble in the 1970s and 80s when professional American economists took the, the Soviet figures at face value that we know were all phony. But there's been a huge amount of monetary inflation by the central bank in China, so I think I, I think they're bound to be in trouble. But beyond that, China faces a very you know, for all the talk about their liberalization and all the progress they're making, at the same time, they face a very severe demographic problem in the future because of their one-child policy. How are they going to provide for the explosion in old people that is going to occur, is already beginning to occur, that's already overtaking Japan? They don't know what they're going to do. The growth in the number of people over age 85 is going to increase by several times, and yet there will be a very small base of current workers out of whose income they're going to be able to draw something. So all these other interventions by the Chinese government are themselves inevitably going to lead to a, a severe crisis down the road. And this is going to be true uh, not just of China, but, but of Japan, of Western Europe. Japan has at least a cultural advantage that everyone understands. You take care of your parents. In the United States, it's like you have the absolute God-given right to never have to think about your parents ever again. How are we going to cope with this? I mean, we've got a situation where maybe our entitlement programs could work if for every retiree, there are three or four current workers supporting them. But when those three or four current workers retire, each of them needs three or four workers. So you'd need nine or 12 to support them. Where are they going to come from? Mars? So we have 
major crises across the board just waiting to occur that are going to make this one look like a picnic. Right. Uh, Brazil, let's talk a little bit about the, the Brazilian story. Brazil started off modeled after the U.S. with respect to the federation status of the states within uh, Brazil. And with time, uh, especially when the states did, uh, mismanaged their, their finances, the central government uh, usually used that to their advantage to no, central... No, you, you don't say, really? <laughs> That's exactly oh. what happened. Uh, so my question is, uh, do you think that will play out now in Europe and even in the world? Is, is that going to be played out and we'll eventually have a central government, a, a world government? I mean. Well, there's no doubt that they'll use a, a crisis like this as a pretext for that sort of thing. I, I mean, I think we hear this all the time. In fact, almost nothing that ever happens in the world is, is ever cited for any reason other than to support the idea that we need more centralization. If temperatures go up, we need more centralization. If they go down, we need it. Uh, if there's a crisis, we need it. There's always some reason. So I have no doubt that they'll try, but at the same time, I'm not sure what China has to gain from something like this, from not being in sovereign control of its own economic decisions. So I don't see, practically speaking, how you bring all these major powers in. But you could see the growth, nevertheless, of, of large regional blocks, and that would be the next sort of stepping stone to a, a greater centralization in the future. You certainly could see that. But as I say, I think, I think with the Euro, with all the problems they're having with Greece and then Spain and, and Italy, and, and, and I think there'll be others, I think that might actually not tend toward more centralization. It might actually pull the thing apart. It might actually come apart as a result of this pressure. Do you think uh, the, this uh, issue that we're talking about, this uh, centralization in a world government of fiscal uh, terms, uh, behaves similarly as a, a potential centralization of money? Or do you think they, they are two separate issues? Well, I think they're separate only because the average person can understand fiscal issues better than he understands monetary ones. And secondly, because all the central banks of the world cherish their secrecy, their independence, and they all use a very technical language that most people don't understand. If you, if you transfer power over money from a group of central banks the average person can't begin to understand and centralize it in one or a few central banks that he can't understand, it's not much of a change to him. But he does understand uh, stimulus spending on public works that gives him a job. He does understand that. And so there, I, I think by and large most people would favor a system in which at least they feel like they have some remote control, some kind of influence over those spending decisions. But since they right now they have zero influence, they have no influence at all over money, well they would still have no influence if that were further centralized. I don't think there'd be as much resistance to that. From what, what I understand that you're saying, you're definitely uh, not bullish on the dollar and even maybe in, less. In the short run, I would be bullish because the euro is in such trouble. In the short run, the, the dollar could be very strong. Right. Yeah, but in the long okay. term. Yeah. In the long term, uh, uh, you doubt that the dollar will be uh, we held as the same status that it has today as a reserve currency. Yeah. And also you have doubts, apparently, of uh, the euro. Yeah. Uh, so what would uh, be the, the appropriate uh, a way to escape from that? Would the BRIC currencies, for example, be an escape? Or there, would there be other uh, things you would look at? Yeah, well, of course, there's a difference between what are they likely to do and what should be done. I mean, presumably, they'll patch together some alternative, a basket of currencies or some other currency or whatever, special drawing rights. But but this, these are all root, what, what uh, in the U.S. we call Rube Goldberg contraptions. Like Rube Goldberg was this guy who, if you wanted, if you wanted to get, let's say, a ball bearing from here to there, instead of just moving it, he would build a huge contraption with tubes and slides and water and to get it from here to here. And so, in the same way, we have staring us in the face a great example of a global currency that has proven itself that provided the world with tremendous stability and prosperity in the 19th century, and that, of course, is gold. But instead of that, they'll come up with the most convoluted alternatives, uh, all of which are subject 
to the same potential problems that, that the system they're replacing was subject to. All of which can be inflated, you know, all of which can cause instability, but gold, the supply of it is relatively fixed, it can't be manipulated, it is a, it's a great, uh, not just medium of exchange, but store of value and unit of account. Uh, prices stayed stable throughout the 19th century. All these people claim they, they favor stable prices. Then they should favor gold. But what they favor more than they favor stable prices is the ability to inflate their currencies. So if we wanted to restore power to the people, we would, we would have a system based on gold because governments can't manipulate it. The people can, can decide how much money there will be in the economy. Uh, if they want to hold money in cash, they don't have to worry about governments trying to inflate to encourage them to disgorge their cash holdings. No, they can hold money in cash and the world has not come to an end. I mean, there are a million reasons it would be better to go back to a precious metal standard or a free market money, uh, but I mean, there are far too many economic interests at stake in the current system for this to happen smoothly and without the powers that be kicking and screaming against it. Let me ask you about two charges that typically are held against uh, the Austrian school. First, that uh, it's uh, utopia, uh, that we don't see this anywhere in the world, these things that uh, the Austrian scholars propose. And the other thing, especially the Chicago School, that say that uh, the Austrians are unscientific, that they are merely philosophers or politicians. They don't really like uh, uh, quantitative um, uh, analysis and empiricism in general. Could you address these two charges? Yeah, sure, okay. Well, first, on the, on the claim of utopianism. Well, people said the same thing about abolishing slavery. They said, well, look, slavery has existed in every society since the beginning of time. What kind of crazy utopian are you? But I would say we've gotten by pretty well without slavery you know, uh, uh, since then. Uh, but no, I actually think, to the contrary, it's utopian to say, let's establish an institution that will have a monopoly on creating money, a monopoly on the power to seize resources from individuals, a monopoly on the power to initiate violence, but we'll just make sure it doesn't abuse those powers. I mean, you've got to be kidding me, that's utopian. Why would you trust a power? But we'll give people the right to vote, okay? And the great myth of democracy is the myth that David Rockefeller uh, has only half the political influence of you and me combined, right? So I, I think this is the utopian path. What we're saying is, yeah, it may never be realized, but we should aim for a society in which people uh, respect uh, private property, contracts, they respect each other's dignity, they don't view each other as means to an end, that I can exploit you or take your stuff for my purposes, that we respect each other, that you are a person with your own goals and your own values, and I'm a person, and we meet with each other on grounds of mutual respect, not grounds of, I'm going to use the, the monopoly on violence to seize stuff from you on, to pursue my ends. Like, I don't see that there's anything attractive about that. Now, secondly, the Chicago criticism, that requires a longer answer, but I'll, just, uh, I'll try and give a short one. It requires a longer answer than I can give here. There's been an awful lot written on this, but the argument that, um, you know, the only valuable information that we get about the world comes from empirical study. Well, that statement itself, does that come from empirical study? I mean, like, uh, that, that is itself a philosophical statement. <laughs> but, but secondly, I mean, we don't, it, it all boils down to what economics is. We don't verify the Pythagorean theorem by running around measuring tri right triangles and saying, son of a gun, every single one of them, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. But, you know, maybe tomorrow there'll be one where it doesn't. It, 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 we view economics as being fundamentally like that. And the problem with the Chicago people is that they're trying to introduce constants into, into the study of human action. There are no constants in human action. But secondly, they will use these like supply and demand curves, which are fine as pedagogical devices to teach students how the market works. But you know, we don't know that a supply, uh, that a demand curve, you know, is a perfectly straight line. There's no reason to think it would be. I mean, it could look like this. It could. I mean, there are all different things. But then, they and they understand. They will admit this. That yeah, of course, we don't actually know. We can't know exactly what the demand curve looks like. The demand curve itself is shifting constantly with changing tastes, changing uh, 
uh, resource constraints, or it's, it's moving around. But th they'll, they'll draw this straight line and then they'll forget that the straight line is just an assumption for simplicity's sake and they'll start drawing curves with tangencies. But if the line isn't straight, there are no tangencies or there are 12 tangencies. So they're, they're letting their, their apparatus that's supposed to just be a heuristic device turn into, sort of drive the analysis now. And they get caught in technical analyses that are really meaningless, that, that depend on there being straight lines that aren't really there. That, I mean, as I say, the, all, the whole tangency thing is unsustainable. So it, it, it's, and, and it's the fact is that it, it does not serve a very good predictive power. I mean, these people say, we need these technical mathematical devices so we can predict the future. Well, if you want to be able to predict the future, you should be an Austrian economist because they predicted the future. They don't even claim, we don't even claim that we can predict the future. We just claim that we can say there's something qualitatively wrong with the economy and this is going to lead to problems in the long run. Mark Thornton has some excellent papers on this where he's shown that the Austrians would, who don't use these mathematical models and don't claim that they're great predictors are the great predictors. And yet the ones with all their fancy models are terrible at it. So I think that if what you're looking at is results, and we need to be scientific, we need to see what works, Austrian school works. How did you, um, when did you first uh, become acquainted with Austrian economics? I saw an ad in a, in a magazine, I don't remember what magazine it was, for the Mises Institute in the US for their summer program, Mises University, 1993. And I knew I was for the free market, but I didn't really know about the Austrian school specifically. But I thought, this sounds like fun. I signed up, I got the readings. I read everything they sent me. And then, I, this was before you had the internet. So, I had to look up all these scholarly articles one by one in an academic library. But I, had, I, I was a student at Harvard, but I, my parents lived close to Harvard. So over the summer, I could still use the library. And I dug up all the recommended readings on top of the required ones. I just read everything. And I was convinced that this just makes sense. Just right off the bat, I could see it makes sense. And then after I went, I was just hooked from that point on. And, and that was uh, when you became a libertarian? Or was, was it much later than it? No, it was, it was right around that time, all these things were happening at once. And finally, do you have a, a, a favorite movie? Favorite movie? You know what, what, the next time you interview me, I'll try and come up with an answer to that. I don't right. know of him. My wife and I have seen so many, I can't even keep track of them. Okay. Tom, I thank you very much for being here in Brazil. Okay. Thank Thanks you for, for the interview. Me. Oh, Thanks. wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah. It's not an all-time favorite, but, but yeah. very recently my wife and I saw this German movie, The Lives of Others. Have ah, you seen that? Lovely. That's my, one of my favorite okay. movies. Okay, well, there you go. Great. All right, Thanks. thank you. Tom, thank you. All right, my pleasure.